Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Jeremy Pettis and I'm really excited to be giving this talk today. I had a lot of fun putting this together, calling it the evolution of type 1 diabetes, past, present, and future. And the title really says it all. I'm going to be talking about where we've come from, when insulin was discovered way back, to what's happening now and what's going to be happening in the future, to give us some perspective about what's been going on in kind of the lifespan of type 1 diabetes. So let's go ahead and get into it. So if you've been a fan of TCOID or following lectures that I've done, you've probably heard my story a zillion times, so I'll make it brief. But for you guys that have not heard my diagnosis story, buckle up because it's fantastic. So here is a picture of me. I was actually diagnosed when I was 15. I found some pictures of me when I was 15, but they all look really weird. So here's a picture of me when I was like eight and cute and I got these teddy bears and I'm hanging out. And so I was 15, I had all the symptoms of type 1 diabetes, I was drinking all the time, I was peeing all the time, I got this like, you know, funny dog. Um, and of course I didn't know that I had the classic symptoms of diabetes, I didn't know what was going on, I was losing weight, I was, had blurred vision. And long story short, finally I said to my mom, something's wrong, um, I need to go to the doctor. I actually had a friend that had type 1 diabetes and said to her, I think maybe I have diabetes, it sounds like some of the same symptoms. And she said, no, you're crazy. Anyways, we went to an urgent care, we called them a the doc in the box, they checked my blood sugar, and it came back with this high on it. Um, and this isn't like, hi, how's it going? This is like, hi, your blood sugar's off the charts. These usually go up to about 600 milligrams per deciliter, so my blood sugars were literally off the charts. Um, and they told me at, at urgent care, I honestly don't remember if they said you have diabetes or anything about diabetes, but they said, you know, you need to go to the hospital to get checked in. I thought, okay. So they said, you know, before you go to the hospital, go home, get your, your teddy bear, your toothbrush, whatever you want, and then go right to the hospital. And I said, Mom, you know, I don't really want to go to the hospital just yet. We got our stuff. I'm really hungry. Um, why don't we go to Chili's? And that's exactly what we did. So I think it's just looking back that my mom and I had no idea what we were in for. It was just kind of like go to the hospital. I didn't feel that bad. I mean, I was peeing and drinking, losing weight, but it didn't seem that urgent. So I remember sitting down, I kid you not, having a full rack of baby back ribs, that delicious like apple dessert stuff, french fries with barbecue sauce, regular soda, free refill. So I had like three or four of those. Of course, everything you shouldn't be eating. I finally go to the hospital. They say, you know, where have you been? We've been waiting for you. The doctor called and was really worried about you. Check my blood sugar. It was over a thousand. And it doesn't matter how high your blood sugar was. Everyone has this competition about my blood sugar was this, my blood sugar was that. It was high. I was really sick. I went to the intensive care unit and then I was there for, you know, in the hospital for four or five days learning everything about type 1 diabetes, getting this real crash course and, and, and coming to terms with this is a lifelong diagnosis that, you know, especially when you're a kid, you're thinking, and in high school, just let me go back to school, let me hang out with my friends. This was summer. I was really interested in getting back to the, um, we had the state fair that was happening and I had a date for that Saturday with this girl I had a crush on like the whole year and she finally agreed to go on this date with me but meanwhile I'm in the hospital dealing with type 1 diabetes and that was all that was on my mind is trying to get out of there and so I didn't really comprehend how serious this was um, but they gave me all my new stuff right my regimen my diabetes toolbox and this is what it was this was my blood sugar meter and I always make the joke that I love that even then they called it basic because they knew it was crappy uh, so it's called the one touch basic um, you had to put a huge drop of blood on it. It took a minute to give a result. A lot of times that was error and you had to take this thing off and clean it. And it was just, you know, a minute is a long time, especially when you're hiding your meter under your desk or um, I'm at the fair with this uh, girl that I'm trying to hang out with and I got to check my blood sugar. I mean, that's, that's no fun. And this was my insulin, regular and NPH. And I took two shots a day. Um, I mixed them together. I drew up, you know, the regular and NPH and um, I'm forgetting it was cloudy or clear first. Um, but drew them up together, you know, injected it twice a day, and that was what I did. And the regular NPH by today's standards is awful. I mean, the regular is super slow. The NPH, you took it in the morning and it would kind of peak around lunchtime, and you had to eat when it was peaking, otherwise you would go low. So you really were kind of, um, your life was dictated by your insulin rather than today where we can be much more flexible and actually eat when we want. You can fast if you want, all these things. So this was, this is what I had. It was kind of out the door and, you know, good luck with your life a little bit. Of course, I saw my doctors again. And so when I tell people this story, there's, there's always two types of reactions, depending on when you got diagnosed with type 1. So if you're recently diagnosed in the last 5, 10, you know, 15 years, 
it's, you know, poor Jeremy, regular NPH, you had it so rough, you didn't have a CGM, you didn't have a pump, how did you do it? Oh my gosh, you're such a legend. And I'm like, yeah, I know, it's super cool. Thanks for saying that. And then there's the second, you know, like group of people, what I call you type one legends that have had diabetes 30, 40, 50 years. And you're like, are you kidding me? You had no idea how good you had it. You had, you know, regular syringes instead of bamboo needles or whatever you guys boiled and, you know, in the snow, back and forth, <laughs> uphill both ways. Uh, but no, back in the day, there was you know, urine testing. And so I was fortunate to even have a blood sugar meter and to have regular NPH and to have, you know, two shots a day. So it's these reactions that really kind of led me to wanting to know more about the history of type 1. And I think having this uh, perspective of kind of a time course of when things have happened, for me, makes me feel very fortunate uh, to be living in the future uh, of diabetes that we are right now. So let's get a little perspective on where we've come in the case of type 1 diabetes. So we got to go way back. So, you know, insulin, I'm going to show you in a little bit, was discovered in 1921. But type 1 diabetes, we know, has been around for a very, very, very long time. There's reports of like cave drawings maybe depicting it. We know at least in ancient Greece, that's where the, di the term diabetes comes from, that type 1, you know, quote unquote existed. So diabetes and type 1 diabetes has been a part of humankind for as long as we have kind of documentation of it. And we only have insulin in 1921. And before 1921, the reason I'm showing this picture is that type 1 was a universally fatal disease that when kids got it, they would typically pass away within six months. And so this is a disease that's much worse than like most metastatic cancers right now. It was just really a death sentence. So this is a very, very famous picture. This is a child with type 1 diabetes. You can see that you know, he's, he's clinging to life, he's very frail, he's wasting away. And so not only was this uh, a deadly disease, but it was literally painful that you would have a child that was completely normal one day and six months later would be dead after wasting away. There's nothing that you could do about it. So I'm gonna come back to this picture with some good, good news, but this was the state of affairs from basically cavemen until 1920, that if you got type 1 diabetes, it was a death sentence. So what treatments did we have before insulin? If diabetes has been around forever and insulin only came out, let's say, 100 years ago, actually, we just celebrated the 100-year anniversary, what was the treatment? If you went to the doctor in 1915 and said, my, my kid's got you know, type 1, what would they do? And this was the era of like a lot of these kind of like snake oils and, you know, like just kind of tonics that weren't regulated at all. So here's an example of an actual advertisement. This picture I pulled out, but this is the, the wording from the advertisement. It was called Dill's Diabetic Mixture. It positively cures sugar diabetes. His thirst is allayed. Most instantly, his strength reappears. All his functions are gradually restored. Of course, none of this was proven. And it's no joke that when you look at the, the ingredients, a lot of this was like cocaine and bourbon and just like all these kind of crazy things. Um, and of course, these didn't work. The only thing they did was get people to, to sell them. And you know, we actually found one of these old commercials. And it's, it's kind of odd because I don't know if they had TVs or videos or anything back there. But anyways, we found one of these old advertisements and we, we thought we'd let you guys have a look at it. We have the latest advance in diabetes tonic. That's right, patriots. It's Dr. Edelman's famous diabetes tonic. Guaranteed to put hair on your head, some pep in your step, and diabetes on the run. And don't forget, folks, Dr. Edelman's tonic is used by most leading psychologists to treat the blood sugar blues. Uh, hey there, Bill. You know that's just bourbon, right? Act now before Bill drinks it all. All right, so obviously we had a little fun with that, but that you know was kind of the truth. That's how things worked, that these tonics were sold, they didn't work. So when you ask what treatment did quote unquote work, the literal treatment for type one diabetes was sadly starvation. That they learned that if, if they fed kids a lot, that it would actually exacerbate their diabetes. They'd be peeing more of that sugar out and they would, wait, they would waste away sooner. So they would give them just enough food to kind of sustain them, but not to have them, you know, pour out sugar in their, in their urine. So there was literally hospitals full of kids where they would give them, you know, three, 400 calories a day, very, very like minor amounts of calories. And it was just very sad because that was the treatment. So that was the standard of care in up until 1921. So thankfully things start to, to change. We got this guy, Leonard Thompson, the first injection. This was actually discovered in Canada. Um, outside of Toronto, 
Um, and the first injection occurred there. Banting and Best are the guys that ultimately were kind of accredited with discovering insulin. There's a book called The Discovery of Insulin by Michael Bliss that I recommend everybody with diabetes reads because it's an amazing book. It's just full of just, just amazing and tear-jerking anecdotes, really. Um, but anyways, it was described as a thick brown muck. So a far cry from our clear um, insulin right now. This was very unpurified, um, but it was insulin. Um, but when you injected it, it gave you, you know, big welts and it just didn't like work that consistently. However, they finally, you know, purified insulin. And so this is the, you know, going back to this doom and gloom I showed you with this initial patient. So of course, um, you know, information started getting out there that insulin had been discovered and it was a big deal. But then these pictures came out, which are just literally worth a thousand words. So this is this child with type one diabetes. And this is that same child just a, several months later after getting insulin. And you can see, first of all, he's sitting by himself, you know, before he had to hold, you know, his mother was holding him. He's very kind of almost plump and just, you know, look at the camera kind of like, what do you want? Like, I'm fine. And you hear these great stories in this book, again, and other like uh, uh, recollections of this time of going around in these, these hospital wards and giving injections to all these patients that have been starving, all these kids. And the next day, just literally seeing them come back to life, waking up, you know, almost from a comatose state, starting to eat, starting to put on weight and just kind of becoming, you know, humans again. And so you don't have to be a scientist or know anything about medicine to know like whatever has been discovered that leads, you know, from this kid on the left to this kid on the right is a huge medical breakthrough. And the discovery of insulin is still heralded as one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science, period, um, because of just how powerful insulin is. I showed you this other kid too, um, you know, going through kind of starvation treatment. This is him, you know, a couple months later. And again, you just see this transformation from almost this unrecognizable creature to a, to a human, just restoring kind of these human features, you know, cheeks and, you know, even a little belly. Um, so it just really, really is incredible. And it's a reminder of, you know, taking insulin injections is no fun. You know, we're still dealing with the highs and the lows or whatever, but thank God we have insulin um, and we haven't had it that long. All right. So I created this very uh, to scale accurate um, time course of, of actually history of earth. Um, and it just, let's we'll start here at 1921, which is when insulin discovered. So I mentioned that. And then really there is this long period where not much happens at all. So we moved from 1921 to 1971, so 50 years or so. And we're, we're doing insulin. Um, it's mostly like bovine or pig insulin, so it's not even humanized insulin. Um, there's, you know, urine testing eventually. But it's not till 1971 that the first kind of home glucose meter is discovered. But that was really actually modeled for, for emergency rooms. I have a picture of it here. This was the first kind of quote, I said, quote, home glucose monitor, because by today's standards, this would have cost probably $3,000 or so. So it was really marketed to hospitals, emergency rooms for them to check blood sugars quickly to see if somebody was having a low or being really high. You had to plug it into a wall. Um, it was about this big. You had a huge drop of blood. So this was in the 1970s when technically this was developed. The, people didn't really start using home glucose meters until like the 80s or so. Now, before that, it was all urine testing. So the, the going from urine to just blood sugar testing was actually a big advance. And again, we actually found this old video of what that transition was like, going from urine testing to blood sugar testing, which apparently was a really big deal. So take a look. What's new with glucose monitoring, you ask? Why, everything, of course. Cheer up there, mopey man. Gone are the days of just wondering what your sugar level is. That's right, pal. We now have urine testing. The splashing means it's working. <laughs> Out of sight. And who knows what the future will hold? Testing your blood sugar? You heard me right, it's just around the corner. Getting a blood sample is easy as pie. With just under one pint of blood, you can get a result by this time tomorrow morning. Science. All right, so now we got, you know, our home glucose meters, if you will. Let's talk a little bit about insulin pumps, and I love showing these pictures. These are the first insulin pumps. If you Google insulin pumps, 
the first thing that comes up, this guy on the left with a backpack, I still to this day have no idea what the heck's going on in this picture. You know, there's like just a backpack full of knobs and whatever, and wires going to his wrist. Um, obviously this was super convenient. You could just, you know, tuck it under your shirt, like whatever. Um, and then, so that was an experimental one in like the 1960s. One of the first kind of like actual use ones was the one on the right, which is called the auto syringe. And it's about the size of a VCR tape, if you guys know what that is. Um, so, you know, if it was on your leg, it was pretty big. And it was literally a device that would just slowly move this syringe. And then you could use the little vial or the dials to bolus. So, you know, it had a pump technology, but again, not really convenient. It's not clear how much you're gaining beyond just doing shots. Um, so, you know, in advance, uh, but still, this is, you know, 1970s, a far cry from where we are today. But of course, I don't know, it's just like, there's just all these relics around here at the TCOAD office. And we found another video of what these, you know, first insulin pumps were like and what a breakthrough that was. So enjoy. Those insulin injections got you down? Well, check out the latest in insulin pumps. Cannonball! Better start eating, mister. That was 500 units of pure bovine insulin. Fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna skip, skip a couple things. We go from 76 to 99. So human insulin, meaning that we're actually able to take human insulin, clone it. So all the insulin we use now is you know human insulin. It doesn't come from animals, uh, pigs, cows, but up until 1978, it did. And I mentioned that DCCT study, which was the first clinical trial that the date there is missing around 1995, where they finally showed that controlling your blood sugars mattered in terms of reducing diabetes complications. So if you can believe it, that before 1995, it was just kind of we let people run sweet. Your blood sugars would be 200, whatever, as long as you weren't having lows, like we didn't really worry about it. But the DCCT definitively showed that guess what? Keeping your blood sugars under check is a good thing in terms of preventing eye, kidney, you know, nerve disease. And we didn't know that before the 90s. That wasn't that long ago. And so we fast forward to 1999 when we had our first CGM. And these first CGMs, you know, um, actually had, you know, cords and they were a little bit kind of clunky. So they're not really kind of what we would say, you know, as a commercial CGM. We didn't really start commercially using CGMs, I would say until 2008, 2010. But technically 1999 is when it first happened. But actually, if you would believe this, we found another video of prior to this, much prior to 1999, um, what the first continuous glucose monitor actually looked like. And I think you'll see it's, um, it's quite different than what we use today. So take a look. How about a continuous glucose monitor? We're telling you folks, this is the absolute latest and greatest in diabetes technology. And her name is Myrtle. Check your blood sugar. Day or night, Myrtle will help you monitor your blood sugar every five minutes. Check your blood sugar! Check your blood sugar! Shh. Check your blood sugar. <laughs> Godspeed, Myrtle. Okay, so I mentioned, you know, this is my story. 1994, I had the, in terms of glucose monitoring, I had the one touch basic, it was basic, it was no good. Then, you know, two years go by, I get the one touch like two, and now it has like a memory function, so I can like scribble down all my like uh, blood sugar readings right before I see the doctor. Then like a decade goes by, and blood sugar meters get a little bit smaller, a little more accurate, and it takes, you know, four or five seconds to get a result. So that is a big deal, but that was a decade's worth of like science. And then, you know, in 2010, this was for me, we had the, you know, Dexcom uh, 7 Plus, and then we had the G4, the G5, and so rapidly you can see that everything starts kind of coming out much quicker. And I'm just using Dexcom as an example here, but of course we have all these different CGMs that are coming out now. So the point here being from 94 to 2010, I was basically on a blood sugar meter, and now it's like an iPhone. Every year there's some new advance, and these advances are, are not, necessarily incremental. You know, it's like you're getting accurate CGMs that um, I don't have to check my finger anymore. Um, I can go to my watch and go to my phone. I can share it with people around the world. I mean, it's huge in terms of what is happening literally every single month almost in terms of type 1 diabetes. So trying to get you to be thankful that we're living, you know, in the time that we are because things really are moving quickly. Trust me, diabetes sucks. I'll be the first person to tell you that. But we're getting all these things that can help 
um, us get through the day and help us manage it a little bit better. So now we moved to 2016 and this is when we had our first hybrid closed loop system. So that was actually the Medtronic 670G. Some of you guys might still um, be on it. And it was the first system that um, would take an insulin pump, look at your continuous glucose monitor and start to automate insulin delivery a little bit based on your CGM results. So that was a, that was a big deal. And of course it had issues, you know, you still had to calibrate it multiple times and, and you know, there's always improvements to be made. But the point I wanted to make here is that this was in 2016 and now we're in, you know, 2022. So since that time, look at all these advances since 2016. And this is really what we're going to be talking about in other lectures if you watch on on our website or at this conference today is really going through what is happening like right this second. So right now we have three approved hybrid closed loop systems. We have the Omnipod, um, the Omnipod 5, which just when we're making this just got released a month or two ago, very uh, recent. We have Tandem Control IQ, Medtronic 670G and their new pump coming out as well. So you have all these options of pumps that can you know, again, help deliver insulin based on your CGM. We're gonna give a lot more information about that today. And that seemed like total pie in the sky even 10 years ago. I remember people saying like, you're gonna have this device that'll like be on your body and tell you what your blood sugar is and your insulin pump is gonna just deliver insulin and you're not gonna to have to like worry about it. We're almost there. In the next two, three years, we will have fully automated what we call closed loop systems where you really won't have to interact as much with your diabetes. And isn't that what this is all about? Like none of us want to deal with all this crap. The stuff that us living with type ones, us folks living with type one have to do, the carbs you have to count and exercise. And what about when I travel? And what about when I'm stressed? And all these types of things. That'll hopefully be you know, taken down a peg um, with these new systems. And so if you are feeling frustrated with type one diabetes, you have a right to be. I know I'm biased, but I don't think there's any other disease like it that we put so much on the patient. You gotta wake up, you gotta check your blood sugars multiple times, you gotta adjust your medications. Very different than any other disease like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you know, just take this medication and actually don't change anything. Just do what I say and, you know, come back in six months. Type one requires this like this constant vigilance and these systems can help. So we're gonna talk a lot more about those hybrid closed loop systems, what they do, what they don't do. Um, actually in my next talk with uh, Dr. Bader and um, smart pens. If you don't want to be on a pump, now there's smart pen options. In pen, Lily's coming out with one where it basically has some of the pump features where you can put carb counting into the, a pump. It can tell you how much insulin you have on board, recommend doses, great option. And now get this for continuous glucose monitor systems that are actually good for people with type one diabetes. Dexcom, we're gonna talk about, they've had their G4, G5, G6. G7 is already approved in Europe and it's gonna be here any day. Abbott, Libre 3, same thing, you know, another major advance just coming, you know, any day now. Medtronic, ever since we're gonna talk about this, the point here being that now there's multiple options to get you on a CGM um, because to me, you just can't manage type one diabetes without knowing what your blood sugars are. All these options. And I should say, importantly, all these options that insurance are now covering. I remember doing these talks on CGM at T2AD conferences, you know, seven years ago and people just yelling at me like, you know, you're telling us how great these devices are, but we can't get them covered. And why are you even doing this? This is so frustrating. And now they're covered by Medicare, like, you know, all insurances, pretty much private insurances for type one diabetes. It really has become the standard of care. And of course, since 2016, we've had new insulins of every type, new rapid acting insulins, new inhaled insulin, basal insulins. So if you're on multiple daily injections, there's better basal insulins. Again, a is an inhaled insulin, which, which works really, really well. And then of course, new glucagons, um, an injectable form that you don't have to mix, inhaled. All of this since 2016. So just letting you know, again, the point here is that things have putted along for a long time. Even from the 90s, when I was first diagnosed, it was just kind of stagnant. And if you hear Steve give this talk, he'll tell you the same thing, that when he was diagnosed in the 70s, nothing changed until the 90s. And now it is literally hard to keep up with, which is a good thing. So I just wanna leave you guys with that kind of point that the future of diabetes is really now. And if you're thinking, yeah, this is great, you know, all these devices, I'm still struggling with this disease. Of course, it's still very difficult. But our job is to educate and empower you to know what's out there and see if these different things will fit into your life to, to, to help you out. Because we all want to have better blood sugars with less work.
That's all we want. We just want to live a normal life and not have to think about it as much. And a lot of these advances are kind of geared towards that until one day, hopefully, we will get eventually a cure, potentially. But for now, our job is just to figure out how to live and how to live well with type 1 diabetes. And I hope this trip down memory lane has given you some perspective of, you know, maybe when you're feeling extra blue, that, yeah, it's helpful to know that, that we do have things that just were simply not available a long time ago. And not only is type 1 diabetes not a death sentence now, I'm hoping that people can take it and, and thrive with it. A slide that I usually show at the end of these talks is that we know now that people with type 1 diabetes are living just as long, if not longer, than people without diabetes. This is not a death, death sentence. This is far from it. This can be a blessing to live a long, happy, healthy life with type 1 diabetes. So thanks for listening.